Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now uh, the other thing I'm going to, so we have a poll. I should I go ahead and do the poll now or I'll do it at the end. Uh, go ahead and start the poll. Let's see. Launch poll. Launch. Okay. So I'm going to ask everyone to take this. Uh, if you, if you're going to want to get one of the $20 Sunset Valley Orchid gift certificates at the end of the session, sign up here so I know how many and then afterwards we have a list so we know who wants them and who doesn't all right uh, if anybody's doing it here turn off your microphone and your speaker on your phone or we're gonna echo you wouldn't yeah. believe oh my god in the room, no microphone yeah please all right it's gonna be awful so next is a list of things I'm asking you to pick something you want to help out with so everyone should choose something <laughs> and then you have a list of like 10 things so once you finish all that, then we can continue. But in the meantime, I'll switch to got some people already. Okay, one person. <laughs> yeah, one person from Bird District. <laughs> so what do you want to do next? Just to minimize, minimize this. Okay, go to dash. Okay, there we go. All right. Then we share screen. Mm -hmm. Not that one, but this is this one. Okay. Present mode. Uh, is it PowerPoint or what? It's, it's Google. View. Okay. Is it working? Maybe. Thinking, loading, thinking, thinking, thinking. There we are. Yay. Yay. All right. Announcement. I mentioned show and tell. Happy birthday, Berlin. Peter's talk on wild, weird, uh, and wonderful orchids. Uh, we'll do our show and tell in the room probably after the talk, as we set up for the before we set up for the raffle. So, um, I want to thank Peter for the opportunity table. We have lots of beautiful plants uh, in the room for the raffle, as well as a few over there that are left over from uh, orchids in the park. So I wanted to thank uh, Tom, Perlini, and others who donated plants for the kids corner. We did repotting that went quite well. Um, and I already mentioned the, the poll I want you to fill out for the chance to get a $20 gift certificate will also give one away from the room along with the plants because we're trying to incentivize nights like tonight where we have lots of in-person attendees too. So uh, I said we have 30 something people in the room now, two more trickling in and 40 something so far online. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So first, uh, we have nine new members that joined us since the last meeting. And I wanted to welcome you all. If any of you are here, welcome, welcome. Um, I won't read all the names. Some of them I met during, for the, uh, they joined during the, sh the sale on the weekend and uh, were volunteering. So we thank them all. On the next slide, I'm going to ask because I can't project very well with that. Uh, judging. So, AOS judging tonight in the next room, as well as at Pololi on August 20th, Saturday morning. Uh, the contact, as usual, is there. Uh, I think for Sierra Nevada, they're not having a meeting tomorrow night, this, this month in August. Uh, Lynn, is there any other judging for Sierra Nevada? No, there's no judging during the month of August. <clears throat> as you said, the uh, our Sponsor Society, Sacramento Worker Society is not meeting, so we don't have a room. <clears throat> and our Sunday Lincoln judgings have been suspended till the end of the year. We were given a, a six month trial by the American Orchid Society, which was successful. So now we've applied for a long-term permission to do a second judging a month and we should get that at the October members meeting. So no, no judging in August, unfortunately. Okay, I thought because it was too hot, they all built it. That too. It's only 110. All right, next slide. All right, so uh, next Monday, so always for those new on the Monday after this meeting, the first Tuesday of the month, we have our meeting for the membership. 
The following Monday is when we have the board meeting, and we've been combining it with the show committee meeting for efficiency. And the last couple of meetings, we've been really good and we were done in like an hour. So we're going to continue to try to get the board meeting done in 30 minutes and then the show committee to be kind of prepared and let people off so that encourage people to do it. Um, I'll have an update about that. Next week's speaker is going to be Gary Young G on epiphytic and lithophytic orchids of Southeast Queensland via Zoom from Australia. He will not be in person uh, like Peter is tonight. Other events that we got asked to um, talk about City College has a, uh, I think, the link in for the environmental horticulture and forestry department that you know we sponsored educational grants for. Their faculty got cut on the budget. And they're trying to uh, get input feedback from people that have had class taking classes there. So, if you've ever done a class with City College Horticulture Forestry Department, they need people to uh, give positive feedback to try to get their budget. Yes. So, so yeah. that link to taking to that and then specifically to people who have taken classes. Yeah. But if you look on that page, or uh, there's also a like two question survey for people who aren't those who've taken classes before just to express your support and write in the comments uh and um steve was asking that we encourage people to do that they're trying to get 800 uh signatures to say please save this program uh and when i looked on the weekend they were at about 350. Yeah, so please go to the website and help them. We did this last year and we did kind of, they squeaked, they, they squeaked the word, they squeaked by and they did keep their faculty last year, but now they're getting insults. So we're trying to keep them alive. And they commonly provide a lot of students for volunteers for POE. Yeah. It would be challenging to find that many volunteers. Uh, yeah. So we have the program itself and we support them with the, the, the Gene Lee uh, educational scholarship we do has been going to support students in that program. So let's all like spread the word and, and try to help get people to fill out that survey. The other one um, is we had a lot of, uh, I shouldn't say non orchids, but people that came to the sale not for the orchids, but for the paroids or other plants there that uh, enjoyed the show, got lots of comments from the others that do that kind of uh, non orchid sale in the city, the area, asking for our sort of mutual promotion. And one of those is called Hello Plants Market. They have a sale in Oakland this weekend, and then they have one here in this building the following on August 13th. So they want to try to be very collaborative with other plant societies and, and all the plant people from my yacht. So <laughs> putting it on here, uh, mm -hmm. you haven't heard of them. That's uh, Hello Plants Market. Next slide. Working from Park is over. We did very well. We're still counting all the numbers, but um, we had as good of, of attendance as ever. We pre sold more tickets than we, I think, we sold at the door. We had a lot of cash and credit tickets as well, but I think there was about 2,000 attendees total, and I don't know if Faye were stay. Any other high-level comments, Faye? Um, our, sale is, our plant sale is also very successful. We sold over $4,000. $4,000 worth of plants. Yeah. plants. And then there was a pre-sale as well that sold I think we, we made probably a third of what we made from the live sale. So the live sale had some new sellers as well as the, the usual. So that went well. Between the vendor food fees, they pretty much paid for the rent and a lot of the basics. So I think the, the money at the door from admissions, is, which was also about, I think about $8,000. Um, plus uh, the sales of, of uh, our share of the plant sales, that's our profit. But we still have to pay bills and stuff, so it's not all. 
And so in general, we know it was positive. We're still crunching the numbers. We're getting back to those that we're selling, like to tell them how much money we get and send them a check. But thanks everyone for your support. This month, starting next Monday, we launched the show committee a plan for POE for Pacific Orchid Expo, which will be probably the end of February. The first thing we're going to do on Monday is first debrief on how orchids in the park, what went well, what could go better for either that sale or for the next event. And then to start with pick the date. We assume it's going to be in this venue unless someone finds something we can afford that's similar. <laughs> and, um, and then we'll launch into picking a theme probably by the next time and all the organizational stuff and you'll be surprised how quickly a few months flies by so um, and we already have lots of vendors every vendor from the last two events is going to come back so we don't have enough space for all of them so we get to choose so that's good though. next slide um is mary's right here up front we've been um trying to do our utmost to raise ten thousand dollars the board uh for, to save uh, land, help buy extra land near the Dracula Reserve in uh, Ecuador. And there's two slides. This has been in the newsletter. We presented at the past meetings. It was at the booth at the, in the show. You can go to the next slide. Basically, there's some areas nearby that are now being used for gold mining. That's not a, that's a disclaimer. That's not actually what it looks like yet, but that's the way it ends up looking if you don't stop them. And so the goal is to buy that land and, and then uh, get the government to step in and, and not allow this to go, uh, this, this type of activity to go on next to the reserve. Um, and from what I understand from Mary, we're almost there. We're like, we're about 80% uh, there now. So um, we're, we're, we've done very well, but we need to get to that last little bit. And the sooner we can buy that land and get the legal things going so we can protect the, the draft to the reserve, the better. Plus the owners want to, you know, the sell owners want land. to sell to OCA or to Equa, um, Equa, Equa, Minga. Equa Minga, but, um, you know, we have to give them a reasonable price. So they're going to try and buy this land for about $100,000 or 80% of the way there. Our board put up $2,500. We committed to um, have the society match up to $5,000 of donations. And so we started the first $2,500 to $3,000. Uh, several people donated the proceeds of their plant sales. So we got another less than $1,000 there. So in the next week, if you're going to want to make a donation, there's a link for donations on our website, or you can go to the OCA website and donate and mention San Francisco Orchid Society, and we'll include it in the match amount. So we're going to make the decision next Monday night at the board meeting for a final donation and try to wrap that up and, and get it done. Uh, excuse me, uh, um, Jeff, can, is there a possibility that you can send a blanket email to all the members of the Yorkit Society with some pertinent details so that uh, we Easier can outreach to, to potential individuals? Sure, we'll send out, you know what, after this, we usually announce the next speaker uh, the day or so after the meeting. So we'll include something about that so it's easier to click and find the donate button. That's what you're asking for like to get the donation, make it easier with a direct email about this. But the donate button is yeah. you know, just click the button. Thanks, Curtis. Right, I, I understand that, however, um, for, for some of us who would like to try to garner some donations from other individuals, I, I, I personally would need a little more information so I, if possible, I could present it to uh, the possible individuals. Is it on the OCA website? Yeah, there's a whole section on, on the OCA website about oh. the emergency. Okay. The Orchid Conservation Alliance, the OCA. If you look up that, and it, it's on our website as well. If you go to orchidsanfrancisco.org, it's on the front page. Okay. And there's a whole page on the emergency funding initiative for the Dracula Reserve. That's okay. Tommy, with thank all you, Casper. That would be most appreciated. And then you can always email me directly and I'll follow up. Right. 
Anyone that wants anything from me, just email me because that's how I keep track of what I've not done. There, what is the deadline? <laughs> well, there isn't a hard deadline, but the issue is that the mining companies are trying to buy the land at the same time. And so the owners are only going to hold out for so long. And so we would really like to be able to send the money by the end of August. And then we can, because there's also legal things we have to do too about titles and so forth. And that all takes much longer in Ecuador than it does here. So this has the link and some more information. Uh, yeah, we have about 3,000 people in the society and the board. And already generated before our kids in the park weekend and i think we got about another thousand to twelve hundred i'm not sure exactly what it's certainly for everybody that wants to match it would be handy to have that information of it being done to put a little fire underneath everybody that's what we'll make the decision to on monday choose match on monday night so Try if you are thinking about it before monday would be fantastic <clears throat> you very much can we double your donation right. yes yeah, so double your donation and have real impact uh, one other additional question um, in in the um, OCA is there uh, an indication of where this property is located? Yes, there's a map. It shows it up at the um, border of Colombia and Ecuador and sort of the northwest corner. Okay. But there's a map of the reserve and there's also on that same map sure little white. <laughs> shapes which are the uh property that we're trying to buy that's adjacent to the reserve okay great thank you thanks casper okay so i'm mindful of time at 7 30. i'm not going to introduce peter yet this is his intro slide we'll come back to that after uh show and tell this is on gary for next month on september 6th uh where people here know about the mask i think that's the last slide any questions or other announcements before we start Lynn's show and tell? All right, let me uh, stop sharing. There's Casper. <laughs> okay, Casper. Yeah, the IT department. Oh, and Adam put in the chat on Zoom the link to the Jackson Reserve OCA right there. So you can open the chat window on Zoom, you can get that. All right. Uh, how are we doing, Lynn? Are you ready? You're on mute. Go on mute. Go on mute, Lynn. Still muted. Mm -hmm. Can you hear Here we me? Go. Yep. Yeah, we can hear you now. <laughs> yeah. Now, hey, Chair, go to your slideshow. Okay. What do you see? Um, nothing yet. Do <laughs> you see it with my notes or without my notes? No, no, nothing yet. I see you. We don't even see the screen. Yet. You're with lovely. The screen. <laughs> Lynn, you are not sharing. Hi, Tom. Hello. Yeah, Lynn, you are not sharing. Hello. Yet. Go to the bottom and do share screen again. Yeah. Uh, I'll go down there. It should show. We're going to get a big button. <laughs> share screen. Press here. Write it, write it down. I can't say anything. I can't do it. No, we're just going to have to figure out a way for you to instantaneously transport the toy. Oh, it's funny because they got there. Oh, something's happening. We see it. Perfect. Yeah. I'm the ice cream. The old mom. So. <laughs> this has got to be the hardest job ever. Okay. I've learned. I've learned a few things. Oh, you need slideshow view. Uh, That's it right there, Lynn. You that. You got it. Yeah, it's 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 definitely can be really loud. It's impressive. It's always impressive. Yeah. 
second. We're going to stop sharing for a minute. Right. Yeah. One raise money auction on Blue's husband. Sure. <laughs> it says he uh, uh, yeah. 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 share screen. I'm happy to share. And then uh, right. well, there we go. Let's go. Why is it? I don't know. For some reason, it's not. It's not letting you see your. Here, move this over here. Oh, if you advance, we can. I'll read it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We're good. Sorry. Oh, that's why. Right. The two screens collapsed on top of each other. Okay. okay. All right. So you're still, you, you see the appropriate screen, right? You see the slide. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. All right. Forward. The slide is not changing, is that right? Okay. Right. 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 There you go. Wait. Uh, All right. Uh, okay. This. 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 this, 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 this oh. Oh. All right. Back up. Is this it? All right. Let's open that. It's good. Hey, did you eat, eat a lipstick or something? No. Right. Yeah. Now, are you seeing the slideshow? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Tell me if this if it changes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Good. You're good to go. Write that down. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Goodbye. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let me just move this so I can see. Okay, so we still have lots of Loom. We have uh, show and tell from 18 contributors and the order to see them is the order in which I received them. And we're gonna start with uh, two from Kate Klum, which I missed last month, so I apologize for that. Here's her Thunia alba. These are, uh, there are a handful of species in this terrestrial genus. Thunia, can you hear me? Yeah. I hear other people talking. Uh, anyway, uh, these, Thunias do not have pseudobulbs. They're found in China, India, Southeast Asia. And I've clipped out a section of Kay's lip. I, I guess I mean the lip of Kay's flower. And it's a little fuzzy on the right, but it shows the intricacy of the keels and lots of fringes. This is a large, uh, up to 24 inch tall cane with a terminal inflorescence, which can have five to 10 nodding Cattleya-like flowers. It's cool to warm growing. Kay grows it in the intermediate greenhouse on a five inch cork mount, but it can also be grown potted in a, a rich, fast draining medium. It goes completely deciduous in the fall and a cool dry rest is absolutely essential for good growth and flowering. This is Kay's Arides rosea, which has completely climbed off its mount in the intermediate greenhouse. This is a monopodial species. Best grown mounted or in a slab basket with little or no potting medium. The roots. Can everybody else mute? I'm hearing lots of other voices. Thanks. Um, so the roots, roots really prefer to grow in the air, just as they would in their habitat in Asia and the Philippines. Erides are similar to Vanda, but with a they have a forward facing spur and the waxy flowers are fragrant. Rosea needs to be watered and fertilized regularly, it needs good humidity, frequent mistings throughout hot summer months. And this is, this is really a charmer, Kay. 
This is her Pleurothallus dilemma. Pleurothallus is the largest genus in the New World with over a thousand species in the subtropic and tropical Americas. Generally, they're epiphytes. They often have a single inflorescence arising from the leaf base, like this very curious one, which has fleshy leaves that they look like pea pods hanging there. And then there's almost like a, a horn-like projection above the flower. This is found in Ecuador at elevations from 5,800 to 6,500 feet. So it is a cool grower found in the shade. We can see that fuzzy burgundy flower is about an inch long. That's just adorable. This is Caius pleurothallus tryptorantha. This is found in Central America and Northern South America, generally at elevations from 2,500 to 6,500 feet in densely forested areas. So this grows in the intermediate greenhouse as well. It prefers moderately bright light, good air movement at all times. And there are about five or six um, half inch flowers on each of these pendant inflorescences. This plant has really grown beautifully with very clean foliage, nice, Kay. This is Ron Ludwig's first show and tell entry. Thank you, Ron. This is his unregistered hybrid, the Sophrolalia Catlea Apricot Gem by SLC Jersey Summer. And those colors certainly are the epitome of summer. Ron bought this from Sunset Valley Orchids at POE. It's a complex hybrid, as you can see, and it's about 42% uh, Sophronitis coccinea, which gives it the brilliant scarlet coloring. It looks like this flower is not quite fully open as it's still kind of cuppy. Ron says it's about an inch and a half across. It may also be a first bloom seedling. So in that case, the next bloom will be even bigger and fuller. Tyler Albrecht shows us Dendrobium amboinense, which is one of the most graceful and beautiful of all the dendrobiums. This is a species native, native to the Moluccas Islands of Indonesia as a small sized, warm growing epiphyte with dramatically oversized flowers. They're about four inches long. <clears throat> it's very interesting to see the buds on the left, then in the center beginning to open, then in their glory with the deep maroon picotee on the edges of the lip. It's a nice photo story, Tyler, thank you. There's only one AOS award on this species and it has the clonal name Perfect Timing, which is appropriate because the flowers are very short lived. Tyler says it's fully open for maybe an hour and then it starts to wilt. And after six hours, it's done. But he managed to, after he took the photo, he managed to self it. And he has a nice fat seed pot developing. These flowers are also fragrant. Judy Carney shows us Epidendrum saphonitis, which is a species native to Ecuador and Peru at elevations from 6,500 to 11,000 feet. So it is definitely a cool grower. It's found in very wet montane forests, growing very low on tree trunks in deep shade with constant moisture which Judy is giving it as we can see by the heavy moss. This is a small sized pendant growing species and the name Sophronitis means modest, referring to the small size of the plant. The relatively large flower is about an inch and a quarter wide with a deep enclosed lip, which allows the specific pollinator inside to do its business. Judy bought this at Redlands in 2016 from Peru Flora and she grows it in her cool greenhouse. This is Judy's Dendrobium limpidum, which is a miniature species found in Papua New Guinea at elevations up to about 6,800 feet. So it's cool growing as well. We can see that it blooms in clusters at or near the apex of mature canes, with, which have dark green leaves and they're tinged purple on the reverse. So it's a pretty plant. Dendrobium limpidum is very similar to Dendrobium dicoides. But from what Jay Fowl and others say, the difference is that limpidum is deciduous and it has pendant rather than creeping canes. The flowers are less than a half an inch, but they're very stunning. This is Judea's Lelia purpurata sanguinea. It's a large showy species from Brazil where it is the national flower and where they've named several dozen color forms, many of which we never see in the US. Sanguinea means blood red doesn't look exactly blood red, but okay. These are very big showy plants which grow epiphytically in the tops of large old trees. And the Baker notes indicate that due to habitat destruction, they're nowhere near as plentiful as they once were. They grow well cooled to intermediate in bright light with year round water, 
Perparatos are very rewarding orchids for any collection. And I would bet some of you bought some at Orchids in the Park last weekend. Dale Martin shows us Bulbophyllum orthocepalum, which is related to Fletcherianum and also Bulbo phalaenopsis. But this is much more compact growing and has fewer flowers. Orthocepalum is native to Papua New Guinea, where it's found growing on cliffs in full sun as a large growing pendant, lithophyte or sometimes epiphyte. The orchid whiz photo on uh, the left shows its growth habit which, with leaves over 20 inches long. Dale's great close-up photo of the flower shows a short inflorescence with two or three flowers, each about an inch and a half, but they barely open. They leave just enough room for the pollinator to squeeze inside. The aroma is of rotting meat, so this is likely pollinated by flies. The surface of the flower has miniature green bumps, as you can see, and they produce what's called a shark-like texture. This is not an easy orchid to grow, and Dale is growing it beautifully with fat pseudobulbs and new growths. This is Dale's Phalaenopsis bolina cerulea. This is spectacularly bloomed flowers over two inches. It's a species endemic to Borneo, and it's similar to Fal Falviolacea, which is found only on the nearby island of Malaya. This is a warm grower. It needs low filtered or diffuse light and strong air movement at all times. We all know that fowls are, they're like magnets for mealybugs and species like Bolina have large, somewhat soft floppy leaves, which lie right on top of one another. So they provide super hidey spaces for mealybugs. So beware of that. The contrast of the yellow and the purple lip, I think, are just stunning, and the flowers of Pathbolina are probably the most fragrant of all the uh, Phalaenopsis species. This is Dale's Trichoglottis atropurpurea, atropurpurea meaning black purple. This is a warm growing species found on tree trunks at low elevations in the Philippines in dappled light. It is monopodial, meaning it just has one foot, it doesn't creep around and it has an erect stem which can reach two and a half feet or more with pairs of leathery leaves along the entire stem as you can see on the left. And also some white air roots arise along the stem as well. These stunning flowers are about two and a half inches. They're long lived, they're lightly fragrant. And the magenta lip has a row of fine hairs. I hope you can see it on your screen that run up the center. If you can find one of these, buy it. They're really cool plants even when they're not in bloom. They like to be supported by a, um, a tall stake or a um, tree fern stake. This is Dale's Paphiopedalum, Dale's Dragon, Austin Creek. This is a cross of Path Stone Susan by Sandoriana. It won the Best Slipper Orchid Alliance Award at the March Sonoma County Show with three flowers on one inflorescence. Three months later, it's blooming again with eight flowers on two inflorescences and it just received an AMAOS on July 16th. So congratulations, Dale. This is another of Dale's uh, very special paths. This is Paphiopetalum reginae plows Austin Creek, which has also just been awarded an AMAOS. This is a complex hybrid, which has an interesting story from Dale. So I'm quoting this. Some of the more seasoned members may remember Regina and Bruce Plows, who used to be regular vendors at the SCOS Spring Show. They owned Regina's Fuchsia Garden and the Orchid Bench in Fort Bragg. Bruce passed away two years ago, but Regina is now 86 and still living in Fort Bragg. One of the parents of Paphiopetalum Regina Plows is Johanna Burkhardt. Hans and Johanna, or Hannah Burkhart, lived along the skunk train route outside of Fort Bragg and were good friends with Regina and Bruce Plows. Hans Burkhart was also a very well-known paphiopetalum hybridizer. Hans and Regina had an arrangement whereby Franz would, Hans, I'm sorry, would give Regina um, the orchid flask from his breeding program and Regina and her husband Bruce would raise them once they got to be good sized seedlings, um, half of them, Half the plants would go back to Hans in payment for the flask and the other half, half were Regina's to sell. So if some of you remember those folks, it's kind of a nice story. Oops, oops, there we go. Judy Bly, this is uh, the first Zoom show and tell entry from Judy. Great to see her in Sickly of Mary Eye is blooming beautifully. Judy's growing it mounted and it lives on her deck in San Francisco. 
She says the flowers are about three inches by three, three inches, three inches by three inches, sorry. And they really are pristine looking. Um, this is a species from Mexico, found from near the Texas border to Mexico City at about 4,000 feet of elevation. And the Baker notes say they're normally found under, under large oak trees where the rays of the sun almost never uh, penetrate, but that they grow well in semi-shade. It's a semi-deciduous plant and needs a slight dry winter rest. And the contrasting green and white flowers, I think, are really striking and the flowers are fragrant. Our president, Jeff Harris, shows us Dracula Dodsonii, which he got from John Leathers at the July 9th Pluralthalid Alliance meeting, which Jeff hosted at his home. This is a cross of two special clones, Johnny Angel by Posada. And we know that when John Leathers makes crosses, he uses the best plant material. Jeff says he needs to give a big disclaimer. He got this plant in bud and now it's opening. So we wanted to share it tonight. The flower is about an inch and a half wide by five inches long, including the tails or caudi. And Jeff says it has a weird, partially open kind of nodding habit. This is a small, cool growing terrestrial species from Colombia and Ecuador. Sometimes it grows as an epiphyte. I find Dracula is easy to grow, but def difficult to bloom. So Jeff has found just the right combination of light, water and humidity to make them happy. This is Jeff Sobralia La Folie. It's a big showy flower and it's a primary hybrid of, follow me here. This is Sobr Sobralia Leucoxantha by Sobralia xantholuca. Leucoxantha meaning white yellow and xantholuca meaning yellow white. And the result is a fabulous light yellow flower. Jeff got this from none other than Bruce Rogers of Sobralia, Sobralia fame. He got it in 2019. He put it in the sunniest corner of his greenhouse where it takes up more space than most of his other plants put together, but it's a low maintenance plant and has reliably bloomed every summer since. Sobralias are found from Mexico to Panama. They're rarely seen on judging tables because the flowers only last a day or two, so they never make it to the judging table. Although successive buds do open. Our late friend Asuka has the only AOS award on the parent Xantheluca, the yellow white one. Um, and his award photo is shown at the top right. Below it is the other parent, Leucoxantha. This is Jeff's Bulbophyllum biflorum, biflorum meaning uh, two flowers. And the clone Lil got a CBR AOS. Jeff got this from Kathy at Tropical Orchid Farm in Maui in 2020 in bloom, and it has rebloomed last summer and now again. He says this is also a low maintenance plant. It's on the lower shelf in the greenhouse where it stays nice and humid and has bright shade. This is the two flowered bulbo because it gets two flowers per inflorescence. And this is another of the foul, foul smelling bulbos, probably pollinated by flies. The clonal name Lil was given to it when the AOS awarded a CBR or Certificate of Botanical Recognition to the plant exhibited in 1977 by Henry and Lil Severin, who were longtime members of SFOS. Some of you will remember them. I believe a division of this first time recognized plant of theirs is now in the Smithsonian's orchid collection. This is a species from Southeast Asia, a tree trunk epiphyte in shady tropical forests. This is Jeff's Habanaria rhodochyla electric orange. Bright orange by even brighter orange, Jeff says. He got this plant from Sarah Herdell of Need More Orchids back in April 22 after hearing her give a talk on Zoom for the Peninsula Orchid Society several months before. And uh, that was the tipping point for him of trying his hand at growing and blooming some of these interesting terrestrials. They have beautifully veined leaves, clusters of kind of tadpole shaped uh, buds on a spike that pop open revealing kind of quirky looking flowers that uh, look like alien hel helmeted aliens to Jeff. This variety has a striking uh, velvet deep, velvety deep tangerine orange color. So it's really fun. There are about 760 species of habanaria spread throughout the temperate and tropical grasslands of the world. They're seasonally deciduous or uh, in my unfortunate experience, permanently deciduous. They die down after flowering, needing little to no water while they're dormant, but what a reward when they reemerge. 
Dave Hermeyer shows us two beautiful Lelia purpuratas. The first is Lelia purpurata variety striata. We've talked about the dozens of lip color forms that the Brazilians have specified to describe their national flower. In this case, variety striata re refers to the striated or striped petals, as you can see in the photo. Lelia purpurata is now officially Ketlea purpurata, but nobody I know is changing their plant tags. It's interesting that Dave is able to grow this big robust plant on a cork mount, but I guess it makes sense because that's how they grow in nature, clinging to tree trunks and branches. And those roots certainly look well established on the mount. Dave grows his purpuratas in his cool greenhouse, which gets down to about 45 degrees in winter, just a beautiful flower. And this is Dave's Lelia purpurata horticultural form Flamea. Horticultural form means that they're found in nature, not just in, in uh, hybridized, hybridized forms. Here, the pattern on the petals is described as Flamea or flame right like. It's not striated, but the whole petal has a flame like blush. Again, Dave is growing it mounted. This one has been on a chunk of driftwood for about 10 years and has totally engulfed it. And in this case, he's growing it horizontally on the mount, as it would be growing in situ on a large tree limb. The clone Gene Webster was first awarded in North Carolina in 2002. It's really amazing how uh, these plants find their way into collections far and wide. This is Dave's Epidendrum Parkinsonianum. Epidendrum is a, uh, another large genus with over 1,600 known species throughout the tropical Americas and the Caribbean. The genus is part of the Cattleya Alliance and is often used in hybridizing with Cattleyas. Epidendrum parkinsonianum is a species found from Mexico to Costa Rica, growing epiphytically in pine oak cloud forests at altitudes up to 7,600 feet. It grows pendently, as we can see, with the inflorescence arising from the base of those folded leaves. And the graceful flowers are more than six inches, six inches, they're long lasting. They have a citrusy fragrance. Dave grows this in his cool greenhouse in San Francisco with nighttime temperatures down to about 45. It needs very bright light and the leaves get a purple tinge when the light levels are near the maximum that the plant can tolerate. We can see that little purple tinge on some of Dave's leaves. This is Tom Pickford's Epidendrum cristatum. Cristatum meaning crested, referring to the comb-like side lobes of the lip. This is a South American species found mostly in cloud forests at around 6,500 feet of elevation. So Tom grows it in his cool greenhouse and this blooming has three spikes with 20 flowers on each. Flowers are about two inches. This is a tall plant, so probably too much for the windowsill grower. Uh, it prefers filtered light, year round water and strong air movement at all times. Tom's Maricillium trinosudum. There, this is a miniature creeping species found from Southern Mexico to El Salvador, and it's very rare, growing in trees or rocks in moist wooded canyons on the Pacific, Pacific facing slopes at elevations from 2,000 to 4,300 feet. Tom grows it cool down to about 42 uh, in winter nights, and it might actually be a little happier, a little warmer, but it seems to have adapted. As we can see, there's no suitable, so the leaves are thick and fleshy to retain water for the plant. It needs heavy watering while actively growing, much less moisture for about three or four months in winter. And the jewel-like flowers are about an inch and they are cinnamon scented. This is Tom's Cattleya benotii. This is a primary hybrid of two species, Cattleya bicolor and Cattleya pumila shown at the left. It seems to take all of its shape and um, all of its shape from the bicolor. It has narrow petals and a large flat lip. It doesn't take much from the pumila except the overall flower color. The cross was made in 1900 and has never received an award. And that's probably because the rule for awarding a hybrid is that it should be an improvement on its parents, which this really is not, but it's interesting to see. And Tom has enjoyed pondering this in his greenhouse for several weeks. Susan Anderson shows us Epidendrum ciliari, which is known in its native Costa Rica as the chicken feather orchid. I think Jay Fell's uh, side, slide, side view on the left shows us a little bit about that feathery look. 
This is a species found from Mexico through Central America and into Colombia from sea level to about 80 to 200 feet. So it can be grown at a wide variety of temperatures in filtered light, strong air movement. February and March are quite dry in its habitat. Uh, so that's a good clue for growing it in cultivation. It can grow up to two feet tall with growths that arise from a creeping rhizome. And the flower spike emerges at the top of a mature pseudobulb. These spidery flowers are about three inches. Uh, they're night fragrant, so they're likely pollinated by a night moth. This is Susan's Dendrobium Friedrich Sienna, which Susan grows in her intermediate greenhouse on the quote water wall, which means that it gets water daily for about a minute during the warm months, much less uh, water during the winter. <clears throat> this is a species, that, species endemic to southeastern Thailand, growing in low elevation forests in tall trees, often about 60 feet above the ground, where there's bright filtered light and good air movement. It's deciduous, blooming in the spring or summer with waxy long-lived flowers that arise from the nodes of the, near the apex of the leafless canes. So don't cut off those yellow dead looking canes. They are your next flower source. <clears throat> Susan has been growing this lovely Dikea glauca for a number of years and it's a reliable summer bloomer. Glauca means blue-green, and it refers to the leaf color. The little flowers are less than an inch, but they're arranged in such, a, such neat little double rows with short inflorescences arising from each leaf axle. The flowers are waxy and they are fragrant. According to Jay Fowl, they're pollinated by male euglossine bees. These are found in wet forests and coffee plantations from Mexico through Panama where they grow attached to trees, rocks, or the surface of the ground, though they're not actually terrestrial. This is an intermediate to cool grower. It needs moderate shade, humid conditions, and year-round water and fertilizer. Every year it sends up a few new canes. It doesn't have um, pseudobulbs, and those canes can quickly grow it into a beautiful specimen plant like Susan's. Jan and Fred Anderson, not related to Susan Anderson, show us an eye-popping unregistered hybrid, Lelio Catlea Izzy by Lelio Catlea Summerland Girl. This is a complex hybrid, which was likely made by Fred Clark of Sunset Valley Orchids. It shows a lot of the characteristics of Guttata and Leopoldii, which is now called um, Tigrina. The spotting on the petals, the wide magenta lip. Jan and Fred have three flowers on one spike. This is very nice blooming. This is Jan and Fred's Catlea Gemma, a primary hybrid of two species, Xanthina and Chilleriana, shown at the bottom right. This hybrid was registered in 1899, but has never been awarded, perhaps because it just dropped out of collections for some time. But the plant tag looks to be one of Fred Clark's. So I'm guessing that Fred has remade the cross with robust or even tetraploid parents. The contrasting colors are striking, especially uh, the lip with the stripes and keels to attract the pollinator to visit the prize within. This is Jan and Fred's Catlea Gaskeliana, one of the big showy fragrant so-called corsage orchids. This is a species from Venezuela where they grow in coastal mountain valleys up to 3,300 feet of elevation and the tops of tall trees. So they are lovers of bright dappled light, uh, 3,500 foot candles or more. And their average nighttime temperature is 63 degrees in situ. This is a moderate sized cat up to about 16 inches. So it could be a, a windowsill candidate for a great summertime show. Here it had uh, with six inch flowers. This plant has six blooms and it's a real showstopper. It's lovely. Vancredi shows us bulbophyllum that he purchased from white oak orchids as bulbo macrobulbon, but there's no such thing as he recognized. There is a bulbophyllum microbulbum which is one of several huge bulbos, like the one we saw from Dale Martin, but it has very open flowers. You can see the macro bulb bomb at the bottom. So it isn't that. So I consulted our resident expert, Dale Martin, who thinks it looks like Bulbo Fletcheriano, which has slightly open flowers like this. If anyone else can give a positive ID, please you use chat to um, offer advice to Venk. Fletcherianum is a warm growing species from New Guinea with leaves from two to five feet long, 
green on top, edged in purple, and purple on the underside, and also with foul smelling flowers that are said to imitate the shape of a toucan's bill. Hmm. This is Fanx Pephiopetalum bilatulum, bilatulum meaning beautiful, enchanting. This is in the Brachypetalum section of Pephiopetalum, and it's one of my favorites. Fanx got this as a flask from Taiwan and has done a very nice job growing it on. The leaves are lovely even when it's not in bloom, dark green uh, mottled with grayish green on the upper leaf surface and blotched with purple on the underside. This is a species from Thailand and Southeast Asia, where it's a small sized terrestrial species growing in shady limestone crevices with the roots in leaf mold and moss or on moist mossy limestone rocks and shady spots. This is a lovely windowsill candidate for its small size preference for intermediate temperatures and oversized flower. It has won hundreds of awards worldwide and it's been used for breeding over 15,000 progeny. So what's not to love here? This is Fanks Mexipedium Zero Phytocum, Moonlight and Star, which has a C CCM AOS. Fank didn't mention this when he sent me the photo, but he was awarded the CCM a certificate of cultural merit on this Mexipedium in 2014 when it had 42 flowers and 78 buds on the plant. The photo on the right is the AOS award photo. It had about 250 growths and it completely filled the container. That hits high on the applause meter tonight. This charming little species can be difficult to grow successfully in cultivation, so big kudos to Vink. Mexipedium is a monotypic genus, meaning uh, the genus has only this one species in it, which is surprising because the taxonomists love to lump things together these days. Mexipedium was actually removed from Cypripedia because of the different leaf and flower morphology. This is a hot to worm growing species, grows in, Myth in Mexico as a, oh, uh oh, yikes, 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 yikes. There's something wrong. Uh, grows on rocks and limestone outcrops. Roberta Fox shows us a couple of catacetum species tonight, which she moves outside in Costa Mesa, Southern California in the spring, as soon as the nights are above 55 degrees and they are in active growth. Then they get lots of water and time release fertilizer. They seem to benefit from the bright light and fresh outdoors, she says. This first catacetum expansum, um, she shows three different plants of this species. Catacetums are one of the few orchids which have two forms of flowers, male and female fl flowers, rather than each flower having both male and female parts, which most orchids have. On the left and in the center are the two males showing different color forms, and the callus looks like plastic or ceramic. The plant on the right has female flowers, and the arched stick shows how big it is, and it's still fairly early in their growing season. In general, female flowers are achieved by giving a mature plant high direct light, and male flowers will be produced on flowers with some um, shading. Here's a cool thing about the male flowers. Oops. Um, they actually can eject pollinia up to eight feet. And uh, there's another. This is Roberta's Catacetum platyceps, a large sized, hot to warm growing lithophyte or terrestrial, but it does well in cultivation uh, in conventional mixes. At first glance, these look like female flowers because of the helmet shape and because they're green. Um, that's true of all catacetums. But on closer examination, it shows those triggers inside. So these are actually the male flowers. Roberta says she's not yet gotten female flowers from this plant, so the comparison would be interesting. The species is native to Brazil and Colombia, Suriname, Guyana, and the flowers are said to have a pleasing scent of licorice. If you're dying to try some of these very sexy catacetum orchids, the great catacetum grower and hybridizer is Fred Clark of Sunset Valley Orchids, so you'll want to check out his website. Roberta's Inobulbon munificum. There are two species in this genus that was separ separated uh, in the early 1900s from Dendrobium, partially because of the fibery leaf sheaths that form almost a basket around the mature pseudobulb, which we see in Roberta's bottom photo. 
has those long hairs growing around the nodes, so it has the overall appearance of being fuzzy. The 18 inch tall inflorescence arises from the base of the pseudobulbs and it branches out with uh, many one and a half inch flowers. It often blooms twice a year. These are endemic to New Caledonia. They occur over a range of eleva elevations. Roberta grows it outdoors in coastal Southern California, so it experiences winter nights into the mid thirties with no ill effects. It may be lumped back into dendrobium because the uh, taxonomists don't like monotypic genera, but it is quite distinct from uh, dendrobiums. The pendant inflorescences on this are beautiful. Kudos on this one as well. Roberta's dendrobium glomeratum, synonym dendrobium sulawesiense. This is native to New Guinea and the Molucca Islands. All the information that I found indicates that it grows at low elevations and requires warm conditions. However, Roberta's plant grows very well outside for her with temperatures into the mid thirties in the winters, winter time. This indicates that it likely does occur over a wide range of elevations. The hot magenta of the segments is made even more vibrant by the contrasting orange lip. It's best mounted on tree fern or cork to accommodate the pendant growing canes and it needs high humidity. The flowers are about an inch, maybe an inch and a quarter with diamond dust texture that sparkles in the light. Javier Perez Sanchez shows us this beautiful Lelia or Catlea purpurata with 33 flowers. He says this is a cross of two great purpurata clones, find one by ours. This is a beautiful showing and a wonderfully grown clean plant. It looks like it's growing in a large wooden basket with some room for a year or two of growth. And this is already turning into a fine specimen plant. The sepals and petals have a slight blush, so it would probably be called Flamea in its native Brazil. And the lip color is really stunning. Javier's Cymbidium peewee, Jim Williams, has 14 arching spikes and is putting on a super display that hits, hits the applause meter. This merits a visit to the judging table, I think, Javier. Peewee is a primary hybrid of two Cymbidium species, Matidum by Floribundum, both of which are late spring to summer bloomers. So this is a nice crossing of two excellent Cymbidium parents. It was registered in 1966. It can take cool to warm temperatures, bright and direct light, and regular watering and feeding, the old weekly, weekly motto, uh, while it's in growth, much less in the winter months. I've experienced three orchid miracles this month, plants which finally decided to bloom after I threatened to compost them. This is Sabrilia maduroi, which I bought from Cindy Hill when she closed her Daily City greenhouse three years ago. It's a huge plant. Maybe you can see the pot is set in a black milk crate to hold it upright. And I've moved it around each year, trying to find the right spot to get it to bloom. Finally, this year it has about 30 flowers. They're small, but very lovely. So Borrelia is a terrestrial genus from Mexico to South America, found in Panama up to 7,500 feet. So I have it in an unheated greenhouse, surrounded by Spanish moss and uh, trays of water for humidity. And I recently added the shade cloth at the recommendation of Ron Parsons, and that seems to be the magic it needed to initiate blooming. Now that it's bloomed, I will try to divide it in the next few months, fingers crossed, because Sabrellias are very finicky about being disturbed. Miracle number two is my Cymbidiala Louis Lecouf. Cymbidiala is a Madagascar genus, genus with three species. Two are epiphytic and one is terrestrial. This is a primary hybrid of one of each, terrestrial and epiphytic. And maybe that's why this is the ugliest plant in my greenhouse. Oh. I couldn't even bear to show you a photo of the plant. Susan, is this ugly or what? I think it's, it's cute. It's ugly. Yes. The flower is not bad. Pretty the plant. But the plant is, is awful. The plant was made by Marcel Lecouf in France in 2007, and he named it for his father. It's never been awarded, perhaps because the flower isn't exactly thrilling, but I bought it from Rai Tokunaga in 2018 as a blooming size plant, and this is its first bloom. So a mother can love even her ugly, ugly offspring, right? And my Dendrobium cinnabarinum. This is a species endemic to Borneo, and I looked for one of these for some time before I was able to buy one from Andy's Orcas in 2018. It continues to grow, but it has never bloomed. Marnie Tur Turkel got tired of hearing me whine about it, 
and she generously gave me this lovely mounted plants a few months ago, along with instructions for growing it. And last week, this flower opened. I can't really claim this as my miracle because it probably initiated the flower while it was still at Marnie's, but I'm thrilled to see it nevertheless. It's found in Borneo in moss forests, and Jay Fowles notes indicate that the blooms arise from near the index of leafless stems. And I have to say my original plant has plenty of leafless stems. The flower is about three inches, it's short-lived, and I love the vermilion color. Before we move on to the Pets and Orchid Parade, uh, we already talked about Orchid Conservation Alliance, but I put this slide in before I knew that uh, that was going to be a discussion during the announcements. This is a little reminder about the efforts and needs of the Orchid Conservation Alliance. Um, just another reminder to donate to an important clause. Also, there's a free weekly podcast called In Defense of Plants. Their logo is shown there on the right. They uh, put out a new episode interview each Sunday. And it's a little plant geeky, which I love. And I enjoy listening to it en route to the greenhouse in Bolinas. There are frequently episodes about orchids, but they're about all kinds of plants. Um, a recent one was about the Million Orchid Project in Florida. And just two weeks ago, there was a very interesting interview with Javier Robayo, who manages the Dracula Reserve for Echo Minga with tremendous support from OCA. His stories are very interesting about the specific uh, challenges they face from daily from poachers, especially the gold miners who illegally come into the reserve and the, the efforts of Echo Minga to um, educate the local population to learn to protect the Dracula Reserve. Check it out. This is uh, really important. Now for our pets. This is Ron Ludwig's beautiful Shiba Inu dog, Kitsu, after her favorite activity of playing with a hose in the yard. She looks very pleased and smug. <laughs> and Dave's Goldfish Pond, complete with water lilies. That's it for tonight. So thank you to everyone who contributed. We'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Happy birthday. Thank you. Wonderful as always. Thank you. Let's see. Um, okay, so I'm going to tee up Peter's talk, take a quick bio break anytime if you need it. Drinks and cookies are there. Raffle tickets. Faye, are we selling raffle tickets for the plant table? Do you want to say a word? They're in sale at the back. No, we are not selling tickets. Six for five or a dollar a piece. Get them while they last. Oh. Oh, you want to stop sharing? Like a, oh, yeah, it's in the laptop. Smaller. If it's not in there, it's in the laptop case. 
talk is on the wild, weird, but still wonderful orchid. Uh, and it's a portrait of the kind of the bizarre, some of the strange and the fascinating world of orchid. So I developed this program because there is such a wide diversity of orchids out there. Um, some of them we would say are very beautiful. Some of them are not so beautiful, uh, but they are all fascinating in their own point. So tonight, what we're going to look at is I'm going to start off with <clears throat> just the uh, plants, flowers that have wild color. Then we're going to progress to caloric types, great uh, flowers with crazy lips, fringed flowers, hairy flowers, animal or insect-like, uh, then down to the weird and bizarre and alien. Okay, so we'll start off with wild color. So the first one is uh, Pescatoria Calesti. One of the colors of orchids that people are always fascinated with are blue orchids. And one reason is because there are so few blue, true blue colored orchid flowers. Um, but this one comes from Ecuador and it's in the, uh, it's in the Zygopendulum type alliance. Uh, these have beautifully barred blue and violet uh, colored flowers. Okay, the, the uh, you know, on, on Zoom, we're not seeing the... They just oh. see a slide, fixed slide, the first okay. slide. Yes. Okay. They're yes. having the same problem with Lynn. Mm -hmm. You shared the wrong thing, that's all. Okay. It also Thank needs you. to be, uh, you know, like uh, the slideshow view. Thank you. Thank you. That I don't know. I don't think so. Started on the pink this one. That's named after a guy. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you can name that fish. <laughs> okay, what are you seeing now? They're seeing something. It's beautiful. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so they're seeing that. So you can have to remember that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but now it's not advancing. <laughs> so this looks crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, if you can call it on the screen. A and B. We need to talk to the road. Okay. Okay. Did they see Connor Orcus now? Yes. yes. Okay. 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 So the next orchid is Panorchis graminifolia. This is a species from Japan. It is I'm not seeing it. Sorry. What I'm not see? seeing any slides. All I see is the text. I, all I see is text. All right. Now <laughs> I see a flower. <laughs> that was the slide. Okay. 
<laughs> Anyways, this particular plant is from Japan. It's a terrestrial. It has a little corn or a um, tuberous root. It goes dormant in the summer and then it re sprouts. Actually, it goes dormant in the fall and then it re sprouts in the spring. Usually blooms around May. Uh, they have these beautifully patterned flowers. They're not very big and only about a half inch across, uh, but they come in these beautiful blue and uh, violet colorations. Uh, next one is another Pescatoria. This is Lamania. You see the wild colors on Ooh. these. These are from Ecuador and Colombia. Pantleas. This is fasciata, beautifully barred in yellow and brown. Flowers are star shaped, can be very waxy. Meliagris and Berkeye. And these come from Costa Rica into Colombia, uh, Bolivia. Uh, next, we have a uh, wildly patterned Phalaenopsis. And many of you are familiar with the Harlequin type of Phalaenopsis. They've been highly bred and they come in all kinds of patterns and colors. The same type of splashing occurs in Cattleyas. You can see a lot of wild patterning in our Cattleyas these days. Same thing in Dendrobiums. So these are mutations where the uh, petals and Sepals are splashed with a contrasting color. The other color that people are always fascinated with are, is the black color. This is a Maxillaria shunkiana from Brazil. And those flowers are about an inch across. This particular species blooms several times a year and the flowers seem to last four to six weeks. And if you look at a close up of the flower, it is the darkest, darkest burgundy maroon color. So that it appears to be black. Next, we have a man made hybrid. This is Fred Clarkara After Dark. It's a combination of three different genera in the Catacetinae Alliance. Uh, I know Fred very well. In fact, I grow a lot of my orchids in his in his many greenhouses in uh, Vista, California. Uh, anyways, he brought this plant to our judging center. Uh, it received an FCC uh, with the AOS and it was commended for its extremely dark flowers, uh, basically black. And this is the first time that we've seen a hybrid that has these dramatically black colored flowers. And normally at the judging center, we take our pictures on a black background. <laughs> but of course, if we did that, these flowers would just disappear. But here's a close up of the flower. It just like, it's like a black hole. It just sucks the light into the flower. So this has become quite famous. Of course, Fred is now on third and fourth generation hybrids now. Uh, so this is almost outdated now. Uh, next category, crazy lips. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, we have our Rolling Stones uh, symbol there. The first species I have is Dendrobium spectabile. And you can tell from the name spectabile that it's quite the spectacle of an orchid. This is from Papua New Guinea. It is a fairly large growing uh, species, probably like three feet tall. Uh, the flowers are long lasting and you can see they're twisted and contorted all the way from the sepals, petals, and down to the lip. It's considered a warm grower. It doesn't seem to like temperatures below 60, 65 degrees. One of my favorite orchid species in the dendrobiums is Tobias. I kind of have a love-hate relationship with this one because I've killed so many of them. Uh, part of the problem was when this was first introduced, you almost had to get it imported from like even Malaysia or somewhere in Asia. Uh, and so, you know, plants that are imported take a long time to reestablish. Uh, once they were grown from seed here in the US, then the plants are much quicker to establish. 
but it's still I still find it to be a difficult orchid to grow. But very dramatic flowers, green tessellated flowers, and then that dramatic red lip with that appendage on the tip of the lip. It's probably the only dendrobium species that has that little lip appendage. What is it? Hmm? What, what its function is? What its function is? Uh, the only thing I can assume it's for the pollinator. It probably has osmospores in it that smells. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Dendrobium unicum. This is a compact species, has bright orange flowers, and then that lip is intricately veined in a uh, burgundy color. Sounds like an electrical fire. <laughs> <laughs> this is native to Vietnam and into Thailand. Uh, Dendrobium hem hemimelanoglossum. Some of these names are very difficult to pronounce. Uh, but really neat flowers that are green, and then the lip is just about black. <clears throat> this is found in Vietnam. Okay, next we have Draculas. Uh, you know, sometimes we talk about the taxonomists and the botanists, they, you know, give their plants these hard to pronounce names and things, but this one was very appropriate because you know, they probably saw this flower and were very inspired by vampires and other dark black things. So, uh, but that's, a, that's the flower. It, it obviously has very long caudi. Uh, most of the Draculas bloom um, pendently. So you would be looking up into this flower. And it almost has a face, two little beady eyes and then that tongue, that uh, lip looks like a, Mouse. And this is from Ecuador. Here's a close up of the center of the flower. Really cool. But you guys are already used to that. I mean, the Pluripada Alliance puts in that fabulous uh, display in the POE every year. More Dracula. This is Chester Tony eye. Always reminds me of a baboon butt. <laughs> uh, we have Dracula Vespertillo. To Vienna and Cordoba. Trichopelia. These have really large lips. This is from Central America. And my favorite of them is this one. This is Trichopelia suavis. Really spectacular uh, in bloom, but also very fragrant. This one has a fragrance of rose petal, rose potpourri. Also a love-hate relationship with this one. Uh, I've killed it three or four times. This is my plant. Uh, luckily, I took the picture of it because the picture will last forever. <laughs> Does anybody grow this yeah. species? Yeah, you don't have a hard time with it. No, I've killed it three or four. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm not alone. <laughs> the only thing I can think of is it has a little bit of a narrow temperature range that it likes. Uh, being in Southern California, you know, we get into the hundreds, and I don't think it likes that at all. It probably likes a range of 60 to 80 degrees. That's how I grew up when I still killed it. So. Okay, so I'm not alone. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next category are caloric flowers. Uh, their floric usually means that uh, certain parts of the flower mimic other parts. So in this case, the petals mimic the lip. And so it almost looks like it has three lips. This one has an appropriate name. This is Cymbidium Ison's wild thing. And in this case, the sepals, half of the sepals take on the, the the lip. Phalaenopsis, this is the Bigfoot type, and this is the latest trend in Phalaenopsis coming out of Taiwan. So here the lip is sort of in between a lip and a petal. And they have it in every range of Phalaenopsis, from Harlequin to miniatures, to um, splash types. 
Uh, but here's a, another example of a fully caloric phalaenopsis. So there the petals are almost exactly like the lips and you can't even tell which is the real lip here. Uh, the dendrobium pansy type. Here are the two petals take on the same as the lip. Uh, also, uh, pyloric uh, neophonicias. This is neophonicia pacata. This is variety kosha guruma. So here the uh, lip takes on the same look as the petal. Uh, normally, pacata has a nectary or a spur underneath the lip. And in this case, there is no nectary. And then my favorite of the mutations is Manjushage. This one has three lips and three spurs. <laughs> it creates quite a dramatic flower. Is that a mutation? It's a mutation, yes. And it's a stable mutation. They've actually been able to use it in breeding. Ooh. So now we have yellow, uh, three spurred flowers, pink, three spurred flowers as well. <laughs> Uh, this is a pyloric and gracum presswood. This is a mutation that happened in the cloning process. So here, uh, the two petals become lips. So there are three spurs on this year plant. Kind of an oddity. You know, the flowers don't open fully because of the way the lip kind of juts out. Mm -hmm. uh, Miltonia cloisii. <laughs> The petals also are becoming lips here. Okay, next category, fringed. We have dendrobium parvianum. So not only is the lip fringed, but the petals are completely fringed as well. Here's a close up of the lip detail. Hmm. Which, what type of camera did you use? Uh, this is not my photo, oh, okay. yeah. uh, but the person that did some of these photos, they used the stacked, stacked photo method. I think they use, use a computer that takes uh, a bunch of pictures and then stacks them together, right. just making it look like it's three monster that you have to do that. Is that, is that what they're doing here? Yeah. Uh, more dendrobiums. This one's primariana, also has a very fimbriated lip. Uh, Frimbriata, which obviously means the, the lip is frimbriated. And these are from China, India, and to Vietnam. We have Rincolalia digbiana. The lip is completely French. This is from Mexico into Costa Rica. But there's a version um, of that with the French petals. Yes, there's a variety Fimbropetala, yeah. where the petals are also. Um, finely serrated or fringed along the uh, margins of the petals. Uh, this one is very fragrant at night. It's a really nice orchid to bring into the house when it can bloom. This has a really nice citrus smell like lemon and lime. Uh, Pleurothalus shiny eye. I don't even know how to pronounce that. How do you pronounce that? Shiny eye, shiny eye. Anyways, this is a little miniature guy. The flowers are only about a half inch across. It's actually called Thornatum. Oh, they changed the name? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> but there's the plant. It's a tiny little plant. The leaves are just a little over an inch long. So that's a magnified flowers. But there's the flower on its side. And each of the sepals have these little fringes on them. And uh, you might ask, well, why does it have that? It was probably to attract the pollinator. Awesome. You know, any kind of breeze will make those little fringes uh, flutter, and then that'll attract and then that grow all the really, well, really warm for for about it. Is a warm grower for you? It, 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 yeah, it warm. I get yeah. cold. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you it's not it grows on my patio. What was that? Grows on my patio. I thought it, it, I think it's a wherever it wants to grower. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's good. That's a, a nice tolerance uh, species. Uh, Epidendrum lens. Very nice uh, hairy lip there. This is from Ecuador. 
uh, Nanodes medusae. This is a cooler grower uh, species. Now the taxonomists also had fun with the names because uh, obviously they named it Medusa because of the, of the, of the uh, you know, this mythological being with the snake head. Here's another Medusa. This is Hebenaria Medusa. Here the flowers are completely fringed. This is a terrestrial orchid with a little form or large root. It goes dormant in the winter. Sprouts in the spring. Here's a close up of the flower. Another Medusa. This is Bulbophyllum Medusa. So the difference so that one's each one is an individual flower. Sorry? The nice part about this one is that it has like a fringe here for each one of those threads that's coming off the oh. That's right. So Three there's a threads. whole cluster of flowers in that mop head there. <coughs> there's what the plant looks like when it's in bloom. Great, really showy specimen of plant. That lasts only like two or three days. So. Yeah, only two or three days. Yeah, yeah really. it's very short. And it's hard to bring it to a show because it's been all tangled. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's fascinating special. to watch this bloom, though, because when it first opens, it's kind of really tight. And then those sepals start to grow. And then it'll, that's after it opens, it forms those moth heads. Harry. <laughs> the hairiest person I know, our friend Chewy. Uh, well, this is Haraella retropala. This is a species from Taiwan, a little miniature guy. Uh, the nice thing about this species, it blooms throughout the year. It's almost in bloom all the time. Uh, but uh, if you look at the close up, you'll see that the lift is very furry. Because mm. of that. Uh, Pleurothallus cyclopedioides. When you see the word, the part of the word that says oides, that usually means like cyclopediums or slipper orchids. And there's a there's the flower there. This is from Ecuador. Also a very tiny thing. Here's a close up of the flower. <laughs> uh, looks like a fur lined toilet bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Pleurothallus flexuosa, also very hairy. Uh, Bulbophila phalaenopsis. Flowers are very hairy. Fragrant, yes. <laughs> New Guinea. And you say, well, why is it called phalaenopsis? Well, it obviously does not look like a phalaenopsis flower, but it's because the leaves resemble a phalaenopsis, mm -hmm. a very large one. Like that. Uh, Bobophyllum barbiturum. Sort of reminds me of a fishing lure. Mm -hmm. Uh, more bubble films. This is Diana. The backs of the flowers are hairy. Bubble film Little Anna. Uh, more Dracula. A lot of the Draculas are very hairy. This one's pubescent, which means hairy. And Dracula chimera. Stellus nublaceris. This is the little miniature Pleuris Palace. Very hairy and then very noticeable and a close up. Love that intricate detail. Area Panea. The backs of the flowers are covered in down fur. Dresslorella pilicissima. Not only are the flowers hairy, but the stems of the leaves and the leaves are hairy as well. Looks like there's a slug in the middle of that. 
Um, as the daily astrobilii. Now, it, these are not necessarily hairy, but the, if you look at the close up, it almost looks like there's uh, glandular hairs inside the uh, flower. And those are probably, again, to attract the pollinators. They're thinking that there's nectar or something. I mean, of course. In there. Mm -hmm. Each of those little swellings on the end of the mm -hmm. hair contains a uh, structure that generates a scent. Oh, a scent? Okay. Yeah. Stink generators. No, only the insects. <laughs> uh, glandulosa, so named because of the glands inside the flower. And the close up next will show them. Little bees. Mm -hmm. Do those do the same thing? They have yeah. a scent yeah. coming off of those. When you see a lot of pleurotalids have that, like their strepias have them on the mm -hmm. very end of the of the sequels and the kind mm -hmm. of does it smell like mushrooms, the scent that's coming out? Glandulosa has a nice smell. Some of the other mm -hmm. ones you can't even smell them on people in the insect can. Mm -hmm. Or they smell okay. like mushrooms. Next yeah. section, animal or insect like and other mimics. So we have the real true mimic. Uh, orchid is Ophrys. These are terrestrials from uh, Europe, and they often will have a flower that, that is very much like the female insect. So the males come by, you know, thinking that they're going to do their thing with their female, and they end up pollinating these flowers. Uh, Pleurothallus tarantula. Tarantula. Columbia is Ecuador. You see the resemblance? Uh, Lepanthes calatiction, one of my favorites. Not only the flowers are beautiful, but the leaves are really intricate, tessellated in black. And then each leaf has a ruffled margin around it. And then, of course, what's in the center of that leaf there? It's the flower bud because the flower looks like this. It almost looks like an insect kicking off from the leaf. These are sequential bloomers. You can see each of those little stubs was a flower. A flower was attached to each of those little stubs. A cycopsis. This was called the butterfly orchid, the original butterfly orchid. And you can see why. Uh, Sigma Stalix lutei. Looks like birds on a wire. Ornithocephalus pol poliodon. Ornitho meaning bird. This is a little miniature, so those flowers are pretty small. There's the plant habit. Uh, Hebenaria radiata. This is a terrestrial Hebenaria from Japan, often called the egret orchid because the flowers look like an egret. I've had trouble growing this one. Uh, I usually can grow it and bloom it, it's getting it out of dormancy. It's permanently <laughs> gone. <laughs> They, yeah, they stay dormant, right? <laughs> um, it's a temperate type of heaven area, so it doesn't, it's not like a warm growing type. So it probably needs a cooling period. And, uh, anybody successful in, in regrowing this heaven area? Two years. Two years. <laughs> I think I got two years too. <laughs> uh, Signochi. So here we have some of the catacetinae. This is known as the swan orchid. Uh, this, the one on the right is the male flower, and then the one on the left is the female flower. And you can look at the upside down swan inside of each flower. Peristeria. What do you see in the center of the flower? The in the center. A great of germanium, looking like a squid or an octopus. <laughs> uh, 
uh, Dendrobium cucumerina. So here, the it's not the flowers that are the most unusual. It's the leaves. It's called cucumerina because they look like little cucumbers. But it does flower, and the flowers are still very pretty. Okay, we're getting a little bit more weird now. We have weird and bizarre. So we have uh, more bubble films, view 40 ends. The brand of Florum. Our fake Looks like two slugs. Fluorothalus serotinia. More slugs. These are kissing slugs. But those flowers are as open as they get. That little opening is, is about all they have. Stanhopias. These are uh, always grown in hanging baskets because the spikes come down from the center and then we'll have to escape from the bottom of the basket or pot. Sometimes beginners don't know that and they say their plant never blooms until one day they see the spike coming out of the drainage hole or something like that. <laughs> well, they it, the like that. Yeah, or they repot it and the spike is all, all on, inside the pot. These are usually very dramatic, but the flowers only last two or three days. Mexico to Brazil, they can be highly fragrant as well. Corianthes, this is known as the bucket orchid. Really unusual um, flowers. When the bud first opens, it's almost like a balloon. And, uh, just one part of the day, it'll just pop open and then those <clears throat> things will unfurl. So here's a close up of it. See why they call it the bucket orchid is there's nectar that drips from the top of the flower, drops into the bucket. And the insects will, will uh, slip down into the bucket. And the only way to get out is to go through the reproductive parts and they'll either get pollen on their body and, or they'll stick the pollen onto the uh, stigmatic surface. Gongora rufescens. These look like birds of prey. Uh, Oberonias. This, this is highly magnified. Those flowers are minute. Uh, Dendrobium tetragonum. This is uh, called the spider orchid from, Aus from Australia. They usually have long pendant canes with two or three leaves at the end, and then the flowers appear at the ends of the canes. Uh, Epigenium amplum. <coughs> that black lip and those horns make it really unusual. Uh, Robotetia serena, this is in the Banda family. I call this the pine cone orchid. Those flowers on the top are fully open. Here's a yellow variety. Okay, uh, alien, our last category. And we have our friends from Pixar to symbolize this category. We have Terra stylus. So these are terrestrial orchids from Australia. They usually have one stem and one flower, but they multiply like rabbits. <laughs> uh, I started off with 10 bulbs that uh, Amy Jacobson gave me one year. And the next year I had about 50 of the 10 <laughs> bulbs. What do you grow your I just, I, when I grow them in, I just grow them in a, a fast graining kind of a terrestrial mix. Coribus, these are very unusual. Mm -hmm. This is 
Vibriata. These are miniature things. Hmm. See how tiny they are compared to the moss behind it. <laughs> Looking very <laughs> alien. <laughs> uh, Epidendrum blocks cardioides. Green flowers appearing from the fan shaped growth stem. Uh, Eranthes grandiflora. These usually appear on long, wiry spikes. Mastabalia, angulifera. I love how they point up to the sky. Uh, Mastabalia marca. Again, uh, this reminds me of slugs standing at attention, <laughs> as if they would ever stand at attention. Uh, Mazda Valia sepultures. Bobophyllum tinkoborinum. Bobophyllums all have a hinged lip. So uh, when the, anytime you hit the flowers or breathe, the lip will bubble up and down. Uh, Bubble film here in Venus. More bubble film species. Uh, Bubble film cambriens. Reminds me of one of those mobile things that you hang in your room. Uh, Bubble film bracillamums. So there are alien spaceships from Matrix <laughs> Star Trek. <laughs> uh, more mobile film. Lumata, Durian. Uh, Microcelia stolzii. So this is one of the leafless orchids. They have roots, flowers, but no leaves. These come from Africa. Uh, they're actually very easy to grow. I just stick it on an upside down basket or inside a net basket, and I water it maybe three times a week. And it just sits there and grows and blooms. Another leafless one is Microcilia coralina. It's called coralina because the center of the flower has a coral center. Dendrophylax hmm. lindenii. This is the famous ghost orchid of Florida. Brassicola cuculata, which has now changed to appendiculata. Apparently, all of the cuculatas that we've grown uh, are not the true cuculata. So everything has been changed to appendiculata. And if you even look up the, the hybrids with cuculata in the RHS registry, you'll notice that they've changed it from cuculata to appendiculata. What's cupolata look like? It's different. Uh, I just saw a picture of cupolata. It's not near as nice as cupolata. <laughs> it's got shorter sepals and petals. It's just not as nice. <laughs> uh, Scaphocephalum grande. And our last orchids, of course, have to end with. I'll start with the letter Z. So we have Zootropion alveroli. And the Zootropions, they basically have two slits on the sides of the flowers. 
and zoom trophy on Griffin. There you can see the little slit on either side. Uh, photo credits, a lot of the photos were from friends of mine. Some of you might remember Eric Hunt, uh, Pieter Brower, Thomas McLeanson, Lawrence Grobler, and Theo Borders. So uh, we can probably go ahead and have the lights up and if you have any questions, either on the Zoom or in person. On your um, blue orchids, the Westmoria, what other growing conditions? Is that the alkaline, acidic? Yep. Uh, the question is on the culture of Pescatorius. Uh, I actually have not grown any Pescatorius, so I could not answer that. But is there anybody here who has grown the Pescatorius? Yeah. That one plant, actually, the big specimen plant was grown by Sydney Hill. So somebody must own it. They grow pretty well in either sight and loss or uh, on work. Most of the kind of kind of intermediate growing, kind of fifty five to eighty five, pretty happy. Get resentful too hot or too cold. I was wondering because I saw a presentation on blue orchids, and apparently the height ranges depending on the acidity and the soil. Seems to me, there's nothing a lot of things when you grow the height and level like the blue. Mm -hmm. Which is why it's that I that I can so I've never I've never had a good I've heard that so I would think orchids would not be a yeah they must be trees. they must be like acidic yeah you know, five and a half to six and a half yeah I don't think they probably exist in an environment where they get much well, there might be some orchids you know, that go out the line, but much, like Australia the thunder trees oh well yeah I wasn't thinking necessarily I was thinking the pesticori is well clear. Yeah, they're, they're pretty restricted. And they're in rainwater, which is you know slightly acidic. Yeah. And they're all they're all related. Have you seen that new uh blue dendrobium? Yeah. That's that one. That's that's pretty new. Yeah, that is very new. Is it Iberia or something? I don't want to say even navy yet. I need to say a thinness. It almost looks like a lizard by Claude and I. Or a pulsating out of it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's very good. <laughs> yeah. Did you see the prices on them, though? <laughs> <laughs> I think my friend was selling flats for $600. Oh, my God. Um, and individual plants were selling for like $300 for a seed one. We'll wait for the price to come down. Yeah, we'll have to wait for the price to come down. So you can work on it. He's growing fast, the price will come down. Yeah. People saturate the market. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. So uh, we're going to do finish up show and tell. We have a small table in the room with uh, 10 or 15 plants, some of which were already on the Lynn show and tell. We have two books for sale, actually, the Bay Area Guide that Mary wrote to the Society some years ago that's uh, $20, and the uh, AOS, the new AOS Guide, which she's also an author of, um, is $25. So we have some, a few copies of that. If you want that, see Faye in the back, you can charge me those for those if you're interested. There's also plans for sale from Peter in the back. And then the raffle table plants are here. We're going to so get your raffle tickets and we're going to start that in like 10 minutes or so after we finish up the show and tell. So, um, and then the people online, uh, if you have not done the poll, letting us know that you want, or in the chat, say your name if you want uh, an opportunity to win the $20 cents of dollar worth of goods. All right. So um, we're going to end the poll soon. So go ahead and finish that up. I'm going to switch to. Let's see. If I can. Well, these guys are. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'll just undo it here. I'll unpin here. There we go. Despite that huge uh, area that grows over, it's relentlessly warm in that area. So it's rarely below 70, mostly in the high 80s, below 90s, very, very humid. Um, they tend to grow really pretty well. <laughs> oh, that just killed our. No, Carolyn Fisher is sharing. Why are you Carolyn? Why are you sharing? Carolyn Fisher, why are you sharing? Yeah, I so I don't. And what I will tell you is this is a plant. And the reason I brought it in is I'm an expert in how to grow plants poorly and kill them or barely keep them alive. So what I found is that 62 is the magic number. That if you let it go into the high 50s or below, if it's dry and it's you know very, very occasionally, don't. Don't be okay with that. Don't be resentful, but if you let them consistently get into the high 50s, they'll rot gross and be miserable. The other reason I brought this is you can see it's got a fairly nice growth that's recovering from a near death experience where it got to 110 degrees in my greenhouse. Yeah. The good news is they're quite robust in that way that they come from a very warm place. So most any other plant would have just been torched. These guys, you know, they kind of bleached a little bit, but actually did pretty well. So uh, if you have a really warm, Growing place. Came back to Cuba. Uh, they would grow really, really well. Yeah, exactly. Um, then we have two different papiopedilums. Uh, so this is uh, Limiana and her. And I guess we can put a little bit candy with it. This is Glocophyllum. So one of these, and I can't remember which one, I believe it's Glocophyllum comes from Java and the other one's Sumatra. But there's about five different, depending upon who you want to argue with, there's like five different closely related species. There are multi uh, sequential bloomers like these guys. They do all look different. They do all have slightly different growing conditions, a little higher elevation, lower elevation. They grow in restricted mountain ranges across Sumatra and, uh, and Masdevalia floribunda. Um, this is a fairly, Mary, you probably know more than I, but fairly widely growing across Central America. Actually goes all the way down into Ecuador. Okay, so further down, down, down to Ecuador uh, and pretty tough based on that distribution. Pretty tolerance. I've grown it warm, I've grown it cool inside, outside. Uh, it's and made many divisions of it and tried different things and it, it grows in a lot of different conditions. So Good one to try if you're testing out Mazzavillias and you're not sure that you can either keep them 
too warm or too cold, or it doesn't require super crazy high humidity like some of the other ones. I just sort of mentioned there's probably a dozen different color points. Yes, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, that one I don't know. That's yeah, a good year of two or something. Terrestrial yeah. orchid grows across the northeast of the United States and Canada. Let's see if I can keep you alive for a whole year. <laughs> and your name is? Tom. Oh. Okay. And then. Okay, we have uh, Kay bringing in Vanda uh, Stranziana. Now I'm going to, Kay, are you, yeah, so I'm assuming this is from Philippines. Yeah, I got it from the Philippines. Okay, and uh, very, very, I've actually never seen one before. It looks very similar to uh, Robola Gina. Do you know what do you want to say about the elevation or anything about the way you grow it? I'm growing it in India. Okay. And then we have Maxillary Marginata. And if you look at the picture, the flowers you can see on the lip there, that's in, and around the uh, petals and sepals, you can see the lining of the happily named. Really, really nice big plum. This great forum. Grand, oh, grand forum, sorry, I can't read it. Uh, okay, so Volatil and Granitorum, if I recall, is that Papua New Guinea, uh, fairly lowish elevation, intermediate to warm, lots of year round moisture. And then we still have, okay, we have. Uh, uh, Barbara Sella, Cognolia. Wow. Okay, and what can you can it's tell us? It's grown cool. That is only eight years old. It starts with little seeds, but you can tell it's spread. It's, it looks very right happy. Yeah. And then the last one? Yeah, yeah, I need it. Mary, can you tell me? You know what <laughs> the species is on that? It looks like snake plant. Very thin little one inch. Okay, thank you. I think I think that's the steel. Okay, that's the plan table. Okay, that's I thought it was kind of more. Okay, so now let's uh. Transition to the raffle, and we're going to stop the recording. So, thanks everyone online. We're going to shut down the Zoom.